Um, so hi guys. Uh, so today's topic will be, I mean, this talk will be about GenSim and topic modeling. And uh, well, yeah. So GenSim does natural language processing. And uh, why I would recommend people to use GenSim? It's fast. It's really fast, and it's easy. And I think, I mean, honestly, these two reasons are reason enough to use GenSim. But uh, some more reasons why it's fast is also because uh, it's heavily optimized uh, NumPy libraries. It's also Cytonized. And uh, now. A huge motiva motivating reason for me to use GenSim is uh, even if you don't have a powerful computer with a lot of RAM, what happens is GenSim streams from memory. So uh, it streams documents. So even if your RAM is less and you have a lot of data, it streams documents one by one. What this means is that uh, huge data can be you know, easily accessed and played with using GenSim. So briefly, uh, that's why I would ask people to use GenSim. I'd also recommend those who have their laptops open to just search up GenSim on GitHub. And yeah, now I want to talk about GenSim and topic modeling and why. So the business problem is, well, data, lots of data. If all of you could pretend for a bit that you all work at a newspaper agency, and unfortunately, your job in the newspaper agency is to deal with the data. You have the person who was organizing data before you did an absolutely terrible job. So you have internal documents, you have external documents, and you have no idea how to manage this data. There's no documentation, there's no annotation, and you have no clue what to do. You just have lots of text documents, lots and lots of text documents. Now, how does GenSim and topic modeling help you? Instead of looking at keywords, you can look at topics. And as you can see in this, uh, just forget about keywords. You don't need to look up things like you know legal or things like that. Topic modeling on huge data sets, it creates topics for you. So what you're going to see is maybe that these are your company's internal documents, if you're working in the newspaper agency, and you would have a breakup of maybe something like this. You'd have a lot of marketing-based documents because it's a newspaper, then you'd have some engineering, some legal and customer support, and things like that. So the idea is, using GenSim, you can create topics, and you can use these topics to organize your data. Um, some more information, this is completely unstructured data. Like I said before, the person before you was terrible at organizing the data. But now you've got yourself this. You can create a lot of structure from nothing. Now, why else would you need it when it comes to business content? I mean, you can organize, we had a previous talk about similarity and how they used Word2Ec and Doc2Ec, at least in the other hall, about how to find out you know, similar documents and similar queries. You can also use topic modeling for the same thing. Any guesses why? I mean. Uh, if you have a lot of documents, you can say that, okay, if two documents are going to be about sports, it's likely that they're similar. So this is another example of why you would need topic modeling. Now, for a second, if we are stop, if it's not going to be a, a newspaper guy anymore and you want, you're working in research and you want to understand different trends, like what are people writing about? What kind of research topics are people talking about? You can actually use topic modeling to read all of these research papers and you can come up with topics, a different breakup. For example, in this case, you can see for some reason mathematicians really like curves and points, and a huge number of research papers are just about that. And personally, what I like to do is, I mean, I'm, I, was, I grew up as a big Harry Potter fan, so I just tried using topic modeling on the Harry Potter corpus. So I found out that Harry, Hermione, and Ron were words which are obviously used a lot, and you can try and find out their topics like Voldemort, like Quidditch, like Hogwarts. So the interesting thing about topic modeling, or my mo motivation for using it, is it's extremely easy, it's useful, and even if you don't want it to be useful, if you don't work, if you're a student like me with too much spare time, you can just find out what mathematicians like and what J.K. Rowling likes to write about. Now, a little more about what exactly topics and words and documents are. I'm just going to briefly explain it. Now, top, a topic model, well, obviously, it creates topics. Now, what exactly are topics? Topics are just a collection of words which are organized together. Now, documents are also a collection of words, but they're not organized together. They're just words written. So you can argue that documents are made out of topics, and topics are made out of words. So a little more into what exactly a topic would be. Uh, if you look at this chart out here, now the headings, which are politics, weather, and sports, are headings which I've given to these topics. Uh, but what the topics are, actually, collection of words. So out here you can see that one topic would have words like conservative, Trump, and Clinton, which would likely be about American politics or politics in general. You'd have another topic which would have words like rain, sunny, beach, mountains maybe, which you could argue was about the weather. And you'd have one about sports. Now again, if you go back to an example of you're a newspaper 
uh, agency guy and you run topic modeling on all of the newspaper articles which you've done, you automatically see you can sort of find out that, hey, your sort of unstructured data is actually structured because the documents themselves tend to talk about certain things. Now, topic modeling, it sort of tells you that, hey, these are your topics. Your documents are made out of these. Now, what exactly are documents, which I said are made out of these? Now, say you have these topics and you're going to use a recipe. Now, what's my recipe? My recipe for creating a document now is uh, it's 50% politics, 30% weather, and 20% sports. So this is my recipe. And now I've got myself a document. Now, document talks about a conservative liberal who's the president and who's talking about Olympics. Oh, these are just random words. But the idea is this document was created using a recipe which was created from topics. Now, this might get a little complicating, so I'm just going to try and explain what exactly do I mean by recipe? I mean, what is my breakup? My document, what is it made out of? So how did I come up with these topics in the first place? It looked like, did I randomly find them? No, I ran my topic modeling algorithm on my documents. So now I have a lot of documents. You can see from document one to document thousand. And I sort of train a Bayesian model to try and understand which words come around other words more often than others. By doing this, I can find out what topics are there. Now, luckily for users, you don't need to care how what's going on under the box because uh, you know what, it, what the end result is you have your topics. So now I'm going to briefly talk about um, you know, how exactly these topics come about. But what you need to know is you don't need to know this. Uh, but the most popular topic modeling algorithm is latent Dirichlet allocation. Now, if you look at this particular uh, block diagram, uh, you can see the only thing which is gray in this diagram are the words, which is W. Now, that, that's because that's the only thing you know. What you don't know is topics, and you want to find out topics. Can you see the Z? The Z out there are topics. And the theta sign out there is your documents. So what this sort of means are documents, or theta, is made from Z, or your topics. And your topics are made from W, which are your words. So sort of wrapping things up, the only thing which you know are the words. And just with the words and the documents, you can f find out your topics. Now, if you want to find if the alpha and beta, which are two parameters, are more mathematical parameters. Now, I'd highly recommend uh, reading the research paper behind topic modeling. It's a really simple paper. You don't need to really know much about mathematics or about computer science to understand it. It's a very well-written paper. I just put this up to give some perspective of what exactly topic modeling is, so you don't just look at it like a toolbox, but also realize that uh, there are some parameters that you have to play with and what's going on. But when it comes to GenSim and about how easy GenSim is, I've spoken about all these kind of parameters and Bayesian inference, but the only thing which GenSim cares about is your corpus and a number of topics. So you just need to feed in two things. You need to feed in your textual data. It can be completely unstructured, though if you do clean it up, it's going to be easier for GenSim to work its magic. But all you need to do is this. That's two parameters, your corpus and your number of topics. You can, of course, do more. You can precede topics. This means that uh, if you are working, again, as a newspaper agency person, and you know that some topics are going to be about sports and the weather and politics, you can tell the model that, you know, these are some topics which are going to come around, so you can better tune your model. You can play with more hyperparameters to decide how many words uh, are found in one topic, how many documents, and how many the relationship and the proportionalities can be found out. But as far as you're concerned, you don't need to know about all this. All you need to know about is, I have a lot of data, and I want to know topics. That's it. Now, obviously, uh, once any, this is a machine learning algorithm, and in any machine learning algorithm, you want to find out if you have a rubbish model or a good model. Now, if uh, I don't find out about politics, weather, and sports, and instead I get rubbish topics, you can instead manually evaluate them to find out which uh, models are good. So in this particular uh, diagram, if you notice it, uh, this is from the original LDA paper, which is, again, like I mentioned, a really, really well-written paper. So they found out, again, on uh, newspaper articles about these four topics, arts, budget, children, and education. By coloring a document, and when I mean coloring a document, you pick up each word and you figure out which topic is that word from, and you color your document, you can have a good idea of how good your topic model is. Now, if this doesn't make sense, I'm going to sort of dumb it down again. Uh, 
there are two topics, uh, a river bank and financial bank. And now you want to find out if uh, the sentence out here, which is uh, bank, water, river, tree, what kind of topic is this about? So once you color it, uh, you notice that bank is in red and the other three uh, words are in blue. You can notice that this is a pretty rubbish uh, topic model because bank is red and it's not a financial bank. We're talking about a river bank in this particular case. So a bad model, you can see the bad LDA uh, parameter being passed. It's bad because I'm getting a red color red colored word out here, which should not happen. Instead, I can just color it blue, and you can see that a good model would give me blue words, which means that this model has been trained well. Now, um, of course, so basically one way of identifying whether a topic model is good is by coloring all the words in your document. Now, since we're lazy and we just want numbers and we don't want to go through the whole process of coloring a document, you can also just do something called topic coherence. Topic coherence is, again, another Jensen functionality where you can just throw in a model to your pipeline, and you can identify if it's been uh, well done or not. Basically, a higher coherence measure is a, higher, uh, uh, is a better done topic. So in this particular case, I just want to show you that you don't need to evaluate your model with uh, colors. You can also evaluate it with just numbers. It's really easy to do it. And there's a lot of tutorials and uh, this thing on GenSim to identify how you can color your topics. Now. What we briefly learned so far is uh, how to deal with unstructured textual data. Like I mentioned before, now you can have many reasons to want to do this. Either it's for your personal data or business data. And I wanted to show you how it's easily done with Python and Jensen. And if you go back, this is literally all you need to be doing, which is, um, sorry. Yeah, model is equal to LDA model, and you just throw in your corpus. Here, a corpus is a collection of documents, and the number of topics is 10. So that's all you need to do to find out uh, to topic model. Now, um, what else can we do with Jensen? Uh, Jensen in itself has a wide num number of features. You've, if you remember the similarity talk, which is done in the other room, they use Word2Ec and Doc2Ec, which are really popular machine learning algorithms which are used, and Jensen has implemented all of these. Uh, dynamic topic modeling is an extension of topic modeling, which allows you to play with time. For example, if you want to know how, in a newspaper, if you want to know how topics have changed over time, you can use dynamic topic modeling. Um, again, why you would want to do this is uh, text similarity, text analysis, and uh, you can basically, you can analyze any sort of text really easily. Now, uh, another real motivation for using Python and Jensen and not any other language in Jensen is the fact that you can pretty much create your topic model and create your entire data uh, toolkit in just three sentences or three li lines of code. Your first line would be four line in open on your document. Your second would be create LDA model. And your third would be to print your topics. So basically, in three lines of code from all of your unstructured textual data, you have topics. It's absurdly easy. It's really fast. And it's documented quite well, which means that you can just start doing it right away if you have your laptops in front of you and you have any spare textual data lying around, you've got topics. Now, uh, what next, or what I would encourage people to do is, um, uh, we try to attend as many PyCons as possible. Uh, I'm only a student developer for Jensen, but the parent company, Rare Technologies, tries to hold sprints, like what Koala was doing today. There's a lot of tutorials and implementations on the GitHub page. And it would be really awesome to see more of Slovakia using Jensen. I haven't met many users of Jensen in Slovakia so far. And it would be really, really awesome to see pull requests and issues being raised and more people using Jensen. It's already pretty widely used. It's uh, arguably one of the best text analysis packages out there. But uh, it's also important to know that you don't need to be using English uh, for your documents. It doesn't matter uh, which language you use because it's all uh, a vector space algorithm. So even if it's in Slovak, in German, in French, in whichever language you want to use it, you can use Jensen. Um, briefly about me, uh, my association with Jensen is the, through the Google Summer of Code program, and I'm currently working in France. You can follow me on Twitter or GitHub, where I mostly talk about uh, machine learning and data science. Uh, my French is pretty bad. I'm uh, still learning. My Slovak is really bad. But, uh, well, dobri then. So, um, thank you. Any questions? Some, some of the questions were already uh, answered, I, I think, but uh, let's uh, get through them. Uh, assume I do not know.
know the number of topics beforehand? Or what do I do? Some kind of CV? I don't know what is CV. Yeah, let's, uh, so I'm assuming CV here was with relevance to the small snippet of code I put up um, out here. So um, you can try and find out uh, which model with the appropriate number of topics has the highest coherence. Uh, what this means is that you can basically run uh, your topic model on 10 different number of topics. So say you have, you, you have a hunch it's maybe 10 topics are good, but then you're not sure. So you run a loop from 5 to 15 or 5 to 100 or how much of a time you have. And you check the coherence values and you see these numbers. So a higher number, a higher coherence value would mean that that topic is uh, more adjusted to that particular data set. Now, uh, there are multiple ways of identifying how many topics you'd want. Uh, of course, the default is 100, which, uh, which is, I mean, a lot if you ask me, but it's usually depending on the size of your data set. Um, it's more of a, it depends on from data set to data set again and again. So this is not, I can't give you an exact answer, but I could also ask you to just check out the Jensen, uh, GitHub page of Jensen because this is, of course, a really important topic to identify how many topics is best for a corpus. So there are many different tutorials which talk about different ways you can identify. But one way is to just use these numbers. The highest value would be the best number of topics. So if you run the loop from 0 to 100 and you find that 17 has the highest CV value, it means that 17 is the best number of topics. But um, yeah, there is no official way to find out. But there are many suggested ways on the Jensen web page, which you can look for yourself. Uh, have you experienced with uh, experiences with the non-English corpus in Jensen? Yeah, I've used uh, French before because I work in France right now. And uh, possibly the only uh, problem I face is the fact that there isn't as much corpus or, you know, there isn't uh, the same kind of resources because most of the academic and industry, they work in English. So it's tough to find really good quality corpuses. But apart from that, it works the exact same way. There are no problems. Uh, I mean, there's no compromise because, again, as you know, what Gensim does or any natural language processing library does is convert it to vector space or numbers. So it doesn't care what language you use, and I've used it in French and English, and it seems to work quite well. Uh, how, how would you compare uh, NLTK uh, and Jensen? Both of the li libraries are for natural language processing. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, of course, um, NLTK does very different things. NLTK is more related to computational linguistics, which would be topics like uh, parts of speech tagging. For example, if you want to know if a sentence has nouns and verbs and how it's structured, or if you want to find out uh, named entity recognition, like if you say Obama uh, went to the park, then you know that Barack Obama is uh, a person. So for things like this, NLTK is popular. But uh, NLTK doesn't, for example, offer many machine learning uh, uh, capacities, which is what Jensen mainly works on. And also, because Jensen is uh, highly optimized for industry standard, it's fast, like I mentioned before. Uh, it has the opportunity to run on multiple cores and distributed systems. And it can actually use Jensen in production. But if you were using NLTK in production code, I would be a bit worried because it's probably not the best. There are much better, like Spacey is another really popular natural language processing library, which is, I think, better than NLTK. So uh, to answer your question, uh, Jensen has a different use case. It's topic modeling and word to vec and more machine learning and statistics related algorithms. But NLTK is more about uh, computational linguistics, which is a different field. So there are different toolkits for different purposes. I'm going to say Jensen is better because I like Jensen and I use Jensen, but um, yeah. Okay, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, paper, but some simple paper, I think. So uh, the question is, wh what is the topic modeling paper you are talking about? Yeah, if I'm sorry, I should have been a lot more clear about this. Uh, it's latent dialect allocation. Uh, this is the name, you can just Google search this, but a little more information about why this is called this is latent is hidden in this particular case. And it's hidden because the only thing we know are the words in the documents. We don't know anything else. And we get to find out topics and different priors. So it's latent. Dirichlet is a kind of uh, probabilistic distribution, which it draws from to do it. And allocation is because it allocates uh, different topics to documents and different words to topics. Uh, but this is the name of the research paper, which you'd want to look at. Uh, what, what background is needed in order to contribute to Jensen? Uh, this is, again, a good question. I honestly think you don't need any background apart from basic Python because uh, there's really a huge variety of problems, like documentation itself is huge, and you don't really need to be a mathematics or statistics uh, student to you know, be good at document documenting. 
And I personally come from a computer science background, so I wasn't the best at mathematics, but I could easily join because this really wonderful support group, uh, most of the people running the library themselves are from a mathematics background, and they're really helpful. So uh, as for what you need to know beforehand is just basic Python and that you'd want to contribute to Jensen. That's enough. And uh, the issues are organized from easy to hard, and you can sort of start off with basic documentation and organizing. Or if you're really enterprising, you can go ahead and implement some algorithms. Both would be really cool. It's good to hear it. Uh, have you tried Jensen with the uh, Apache Spark? No, I haven't myself, because uh, since I work in research, I'm allowed to have slow code, which is not good, but uh, uh, which is why I personally haven't used any uh, distributed systems. But uh, there is Jensen and Spark and Jensen and TensorFlow are projects. You can actually see the pull requests being done right now. Uh, what it does have is parallel, I mean, that's parallelization, but I haven't used it at Spark yet. Uh, uh, can I use labeled data as seed to enhance the modeling accuracy? Um, y yes, you could, though LDA is uh, an unsupervised algorithm in the sense that uh, labeled algorithm will not offer anything new, because what you could do is pre-seed the topics. If you know that certain words are going to appear in certain topics, you could do that. But uh, in this particular case, at least for topic modeling, uh, structured data would not be helpful. And we have a question for uh, sprints. Uh, where, where are sprints announced? Oh uh, yeah, so you could uh, you could check out you could subscribe to the Jensen mailing list. Uh, I do know there's a sprint happening in the USA at PyCon USA and at PyData is also we try to make our presence felt. So PyData Berlin is coming up fairly soon, and we had Katharina who spoke yesterday a lot about uh, Py you know data, and she's the head of PyData Berlin. And Jensen is going to try and have a good presence at PyData Berlin. So if you guys can drop by there, that would be awesome. And of course, you could, uh, to answer the question, I'm sorry, you could uh, check on the mailing list, and you could also check on uh, the Rare Technologies page. Rare Technologies is the parent company which uh, works with Jensen. Okay, uh, when applying topic modeling iteratively, how can I better control which topic becomes a subtopic or sub-subtopic and so on? Uh, how to... Uh, adjust the level. Okay, so uh, at least in uh, what I've talked about, which is latent derelict al allocation, there isn't subtopics, there's no hierarchy. So for example, if, uh, uh, again, if you go back to the example of newspapers and I talk about these three topics, you won't have a subtopic under politics such as American politics. This is not one of the features of uh, LDA. What you might have is another topic separately called American politics, which might not have the same words as politics, but they would be two different topics. But if you do want hierarchical topics and subtopics, there's a different uh, topic modeling algorithm also provided by Jensen called HDP, um, HD, which I've mentioned out here about LSI and HDP for more topic modeling. HDP stands for hierarchical Dirichlet processing. So you have a hierarchical approach to uh, the way you approach topic modeling, in, this, in which case you do have subtopics. Unfortunately, I still cannot answer the question because I'm not very familiar with HDP. Because and so I've not worked with subtopics and uh, hierarchical topics, but uh, at least in the context of normal topic modeling, the, the most popular algorithm being LDA, you don't have subtopics. You may have multiple topics which are similar to each other. You can actually identify similarity of topics as well, but uh, there's no such thing as subtopics. It would be uh, topics, and if there are 10 topics, 10 different topics. Okay, thank you. And the last question is, uh, is there a version of LDA with online learning uh, in Jensen? Yes, there is. You can uh, do online learning. There's an algorithm by Hoffman and co. And uh, LDA uh, and Jensen has um, adopted it. So again, you can just go out to the GitHub page of Jensen and check it out. It's really cool.